Welcome to Via the Grapevine, proudly brought to you by Liquor City Claremont and offering you the chance to learn more about wine, the masters behind them, and even which wines to collect. Not many visitors to Cape Town, and even locals, are aware that there is an award-winning wine estate only a 15-minute drive from the city. The Grendel, a historic winery that sits on Cape Town's Durbanville wine route, offers a world-class winelands experience with resident wild game and the best views of Table Mountain. Really sets it apart. Uh, because the Durbanville region is well suited to producing some of the country's best Sauvignon Blanc, this cultivar is, as you can imagine, a core focus of the winery. But to talk all things wine and winery, cellar master and industry legend Charles Hopkins joins me now. Charles, good morning and welcome, sir. Thanks, guys. It's an absolute privilege and an honor chatting to you. De Grendel has a rich heritage, but uh, interestingly enough, it hasn't always been dedicated to wine, has it? In fact, you've been at De Grendel since the very beginning of winemaking, and that was just 2005. Yeah, the farm is, is old. It dates back to 1720. To this year, interestingly enough, we're celebrating our free, 300 year celebrationary, you know, um, heritage. Uh, but the wine is actually, like you mentioned, only from 2004, we produced the first wine. And the first wines, the first 2004 and five was made by myself in the Grainbeck cellar. I was the winemaker then in the Franschhoek cellar of Grainbeck. Uh, in 2003, we started purchasing grapes and then the, the late owner asked me to do a, what we call a winemaking service, make some wine for them. And that was actually the start of the brand. But no, the, the wine is only with us for about 20 years. 20 years ago, the first vines were planted on the farm. And it's not a secret, the first planting was destined for Durbanville Hills. Estelle actually advised the Graf family to plant some grapes here on the farm. And with time, they realized one of the secrets of wine is to have the added value in the bottle, not just selling the grapes over a scale because it's a different transaction. Mm. And, you, and you didn't just join De Grendel as winemaker, but you were, you were the co-architect of its new vision under, as you say, the late Sir David Kraft in 2004. How, yeah. how, how has that influenced your winemaking? Because you really had a, a big part to play in the whole uh, structure of the, of the winery, didn't you? Yeah, the, the Krafts made the, the final call where to build the cellar because they know the farm at that stage much better than I did. But uh, the inside, and I, uh, it's like I, it's so, such a privilege to design a winery from scratch because, you know, you can't point a finger to an architect or an engineer or a builder and say, what did you do here and what did you do there? It's, it's um, you know, it's all your own uh, expression. It's all your own ideas. So I was, pr I was privileged to, and I, I love uh, the design of a winery. I was previously, pre previously sorry, in my grain back days, I was involved with the building of a cellar. And I think all the mistakes I made there, I rectify in this cellar. For instance, we put a big emphasis on fresh air and a big emphasis on light. Uh, where my previous cellar that I designed at Grain Beck, I always thought on hindsight it was a bit dark and a bit sort of damp, if I may use that word. So I, I and of course, you know, the design, the flow of the grapes, you just, you understand over time and you don't want to pump the grapes from one side to the winery to another. You want to sort of have a, a gravity flow as far as possible. Excellent. And it, 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 as you say, it certainly is a very interesting place to be. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, the Durbanville region is renowned for Sauvignon Blanc. And we were lucky enough to have a, a visit with you and, and what I would call a masterclass. I was blown away uh, with your, your knowledge. And I, I think you should be a professor <laughs> of winemaking, Charles, because the way you you share your knowledge. You do it in a, in a very educational but easy to understand way. You, it was phenomenal. Um, uh, uh, it's a problem. It's a problem. It's a, probably a personality problem. You know, whenever I have a bribe with you, for instance, or with friends, and we start talking about wine, and you can, ex you can imagine if you have a bribe with a winemaker, it's, it's on, the, on the agenda, quite high up on the agenda. So my wife will quickly say, please, Charles, just relax. Don't present the flip another tasting or another lecture. <laughs> so it can also be negative, eh? but I, I'm glad you enjoy it. <laughs> Shame, man. No, I can only imagine. Don't worry. It's like me being a, a radio DJ. People always <laughs> want to ask, 
So what do you do with the rest of your day? Uh, do you only work three hours a day? <laughs> if only you knew. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but during uh, that meeting, we, we, I was fascinated to hear about the, the, the different soils that occur uh, at the Grendel. Uh, and, I, and I also, I picked up that you've, you've got a very real passion for the cultivar of Sauvignon Blanc. What, what yeah. is it about Sauvignon Blanc that keeps you curious? And would you mind giving us a little bit of insight into those two principal vineyards that you harvest? Because one, of course, is not at the Grendel at all. Yeah, no, Guy, it's a, it's a mouthful. Eh? I was inspired years ago um, by being very disappointed year after year with Sauvignon Blanc in my friendship days, because then it was the norm only to source fruit in and around your winery, you know, with a radius of 10 kilometers. And over time, I realized if you really want to produce a top-notch Sauvignon Blanc, unfortunately, you need to source it from even cooler areas. So here we are blessed on the western side of the Teichelberg, all our vines, a, a, a Sauvignon Blanc included have a 180 degree view to the Atlantic Ocean. We are seven kilometers away. It's a true expression of a cool, moderate climate. And my friend, if there's ever a variety that, uh, that uh, you know, have um, where closeness to the ocean, proximity to the ocean and altitude is a benefit, it's Sauvignon Blanc. You know, uh, we call it maritime, moderate maritime conditions. So, Years ago, uh, in 85, I think one of the game breakers in South Africa was a Sauvignon Blanc from Plain Constantia, made by the late Ross Gower, a real mentor of mine, sadly he passed away. And I visited him many times and we taste the wines and we chat and we, you know, he told me some ah, tongue in the cheek secrets, there's no secrets in winemaking, but you know, he told me about botrytis and sending a harvest team a day before picking in and dropping the clusters that was infected by botrytis. But you need, at that stage, Sauvignon Blanc, grape growers in general, was uh, worried about the fact that you pick it at a high sugar because rot, especially in high moist regions, close to the ocean is a reality. But over time, we learned to sidestep that. But uh, stylistically, you know, and I'm pleased, I don't want to bother the listeners with a technical lecture like you mentioned, but there's different styles of Sauvignon Blanc. So the style here on our farm is our cream label, is our biggest volume. 15,000 cases of 12, and that's 100% wine of origin Cape Town, and uh, there's 8% semio in it, and it's made in a tropical style, and the tropical flavors is interesting enough, black currant, citrus, and grenadella. But I'm also a fan of another style, and that's our kutsa, is the one I have here in my glass, and that's, we are very proud to have, um, uh, you know, this year at a was one of the Sauvignon Blancs that received a five star from Plateau. So good size is a combination and this is vineyards that I bought years ago and one of the vineyards I've been buying for 26 years is in Darling. One in, two, two is in Darling, one is in Lutzville and about 10% of wooded Sauvignon is added to the wine and uh, you know it's, it's if I can be forward saying that it's probably seen as one of the more um, high price, not high price, high quality, uh, high price, high quality Sauvignon Blancs in South Africa. It's been now for the last four or five years part of the F&B top 10. It received good ratings from Wine Magazine, from uh, Tim Atkin. It, uh, like I mentioned, it received a five star from Platter. So wine we are very proud of. And uh, yeah, Sauvignon Blanc is very dependent guy from the so-called terroir. I know sometimes the word terroir is misused in many marketing uh, talks, but it's really a combination of soil climate and viticulture practices. So, uh, for instance, a Sauvignon Blanc from Paul or Wooster or Robertson, and I'm not, you know, being negative or sarcastic, is very different than a Sauvignon Blanc growing seven kilometers away from the ocean. I, w I wanted to ask, it, it, quite interesting uh, that you mentioned there, there's many styles of Sauvignon Blanc, and I think for people that are just getting into wine, uh, they might not be familiar with that. They yeah. they might think that all Sauvignon Blanc has the same, you know, grass, green pepper, uh, high yeah. acidity, whatever they, their perceptions might be of that. Are you able to kind of share roughly how many types or, or styles of Sauvignon Blanc you, you get just out of interest? Yeah. I think I think the, the great thing about this is to go back to the to your clientele or to the person that just vote for you with a with his hand opening up a screw top or, or pulling a cork. They're the most important, and they, you know. And there's there's lots of Sauvignon Blancs 
There's 7 million cases made each year in South Africa. The wine for 7 million cases, 2.4 million cases of 12 is consumed on the local market. Uh, but stylistically, there's five styles. And, and again, I'm very cautious to um, confuse the, the, the person that just enjoy a glass of wine. But first one is fruity. We call it thiles and forget about the, the technical names of it. That is wine that's made... Uh, uh, the flavor contribution is mainly due to cold fermentation. Sadly, that flavors are very volatile and eight months, 10 months down the line, they are gone. Um, and then and the next one is what I describe as thiles, T-H-I-O-L-E, thiles. And that's the three that I mentioned to you, citrus, grenadella, and blackcurrant. The, th the third one is metoxyperazines, and the good says is made in this style. Um, you know, with, uh, with the emphasis is slightly more on, on asparagus and opening a tin of peas. I know some people will probably frown off this for this of this description. Uh, lemongrass, capsicum yes. flavor. So the fourth one is wooded, what the Americans refer to as blanc fime. And the fifth one is, uh, is natural Sauvignon Blanc. You know, there's a group of winemakers that went slightly against the flow and produce wines that they ferment on the skins that's orangey in color, that's quite phenolic. Uh, and of course, there's a place for it, not 100% my style, but I, I do enjoy a bottle like that. It's wines with great texture and viscosity on the mouthfeel, but flavor-wise, they're not always as attractive as, for instance, a ester or a thyl or a metoxyperidine style. Got you. Thank you. That's very, very interesting. And I think with that, let's plunge into a tasting yeah. Of of the Kutzeis, the Kutzeis Sauvignon Blanc 2019, and uh, it's also going to be on the weekly wine list this week. Of course, it takes its name mm. from the vineyard planted next to the historic coach house, I believe, the Kutzeis yeah. uh, on the Grendel Farm. Uh, take us through through this wine, Charles. It's it's you know the four components that I mentioned from Lutzville. It's a Western Cape wine. And I know Western Cape sometimes have a, a sort of a, a, a very commercial perception, but in this case, I want to have the best of all, of each region. And then I blend them. And as you know, if you go to a bigger appellation, it becomes a, a Western Cape. But this is from Lutzville, two vineyards in Darling. And like I mentioned, the 10% Seignon here from the farm. 15% of the wine is wooded. Uh, when I say wooded, the wine fermenting barrels, we stir it afterwards, we top it up, we keep it in a cold room, and the wood is literally just there to add a, a bit of a richer dimension on the mouth, on the on the taste. You at this stage, 15% or, or it's 12 in total. There's also a bit of Sauvignon Blanc uh, wooded, also from Darling. Um, the wood is very subdued, but uh, you know mm -hmm. if the wine is a year old, older and older, so. Uh, um, Guy, what's fascinating, the metoxyperazines is the most stable component in a white wine. So this wine will become 10 or 15 years old uh, and it will still have, the other day when you visit me, we taste, uh, I think if I remember correctly, a 13 that was seven years old and yep. that was still green and fresh like this color, you know, with this a very light uh, sort of uh, straw hue in it, but your emphasis is on, on, a, on a green hue. And the, the longevity of those wines is amazing. Now, I know there's a group of people that will immediately say Charles Sauvignon Blanc is to be consumed in the first year or year and a half or two years. But my friend, one day I want to open uh, older vintages, especially of the great vintages like 2007, 13, 15, 17, 19. And you'll, burst be, you'll be blown away about how well these wines can, can, can go. Where our cream label is a bit more... Um, I am cautious to use the word commercial. I think it's a true expression of Durban will Sauvignon Blanc, big emphasis on citrusy flavors. And the wine may have a lifespan of three to four years. But again, you know, I think most Sauvignon Blancs, the everyday consumer, love a fresh wine and prefer a wine of that specific vintage. I think you will agree with me. That, and that cream label one is, is unwooded. Correct. Uh, unwooded. There's a bit yep. of Semillon with it, and it's hundred. It's a wine of origin, Cape Town, where could say is is uh, Western Cape. Um, this one Thank is you. Cape Town, and as you know, Durbanville, um, Philadelphia, Constantia, Cape Point, all became part of the big appellation called Cape Town. That just means mm. a bit more than Durbanville, and uh, you know, even Constantia. I think. Well done on the ninety-one points in the Tim Atkins twenty twenty. 
South Africa special report on that cream label uh, Sauvignon Blanc. That's yeah, that's, excellent. That's, yeah, that's really a, a vote of confidence in the wine. And, um, you know, for us, maybe an indication that we're on the right track, that mm. the expert can, um, can uh, give it a high score, but also lots of customers buy it and keep on buying it again. So, uh, you know, the big thing is to get the balance between alcohol, flavors, acidity you know, and dryness, um, very important, the word dryness. So many times people complain about Sauvignon Blanc's acidity is too high. Um, mm. And for me, the big trick is to get the, the balance between that, that the wine gives you actually a sweet impression, but it's not sweet in sugar, but sweet in flavors with just a firm, good racy acidity behind it, but not too high. I think you've I think you've answered my, my next question, which was uh, around the success that you've achieved with uh, that new milestone, a, a remarkable four, five star ratings in the 2021 Platters South African Wine Guide. Uh, you are one of only 13 wineries, I believe, to have four or more wines receiving the top rating. Uh, and, and I was going to ask, what do you attribute the success to? Because it's it's... It's obviously been many, many years of hard groundwork to, to suddenly achieve, hey? Yeah, Guy, it's, it's uh, the first thing I, I'm, I'm thankful and I'm really humbled by that. And, uh, you know, I can first contribute to complete team effort, you know, from the person that cut the vineyards and uh, harvest the grapes and prune it uh, to, uh, you know, the Valleus Graf with his staff and his trust in us and his, uh, the free hand he gave us to uh, my my team in the cellar and my you know and at the end of the day the clients but of course the clients didn't give the five star it was a group of experts but i must say we are very proud and very chuffed with that and uh, hopefully it can give over the bigger days and black friday coming up can give us a bit of a push uh, towards uh, um, sales but we are very very humble and very um, happy about that very satisfied yeah, nice way to top off the, the 300 year celebration. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, all, all, all work hand in hand, I must say. Wonderful. I want to ask you there's been a bit of a Ferrar in the industry around the Platters Guide this year, and, and specifically how its five star wines were released, and indeed the number of five stars achieved. Michael Fridgen stirred the proverbial tank, he leveled uh, amongst other criticism. He said, the number of five-star laureates rises every year at a rate which cannot be defended. You're an industry legend. You've been chairman of many of uh, sitting panels. You've been on the positive side of awards, uh, particularly with Platters this year. What's your take on this, if I can ask? Because is it is it naive of someone like me to try and defend the increase in five stars by saying, well, winemaking methods have improved. Um, if you look at 2015, 2017, those vintages were outstanding. I believe 2020 is also going to be outstanding. So surely it's obvious a, a rise will occur. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I don't know the intrinsics. I spoke to the person that tastes our wine, Dr. Winifred Baumann. She's of an exceptional palate and she explained to me, I, I must be honest with you guys, I was not, not always sure how the, the rating and how they get to a five-star work. But if I understand it correctly, your wine has been uh, provided to a, a very strong taster. I think there's about 15 or 20 of them. They taste the wines. And then very interestingly, if we live relatively close to one another and you both of us are platter judges, the wines that's, that's been nominated to go further for a potential five-star must first be tasted by yourself, for instance, living a block or five from me. And then your wines that you suggest must be tasted by myself. So there's already a, uh, two people that must give the wine a thumbs up to go further. And then apparently there's panels and another panel and another panel. And I'm not 100% sure how it worked. But like you say, we are happy and we're satisfied with the outcome of the platter. If we receive nothing, maybe, uh, you know, we will have a different opinion. But if you... If you've been working with wine over years, you realize that it's a subjective, uh, the whole judging is subjective and please don't get nightmares and want to commit suicide. And I say this in a, in a sarcastic way, you know, if your wine don't get the outcome because it's all subjective, you know, one competition, you get a, a, a huge rating that you're very happy with. 
And the next one is a bit more subdued. Maybe you get a silver or hopefully not a bronze, but a silver. But uh, I'm convinced a good wine will show up, you know, in nine out of 10 competitions, it will put up its hand. So uh, I can't really comment on that. You know, the increased number of five stars, I, I definitely picked it up years ago. I personally, I thought they were, it was, uh, I think the final judging was an open judging. So people could see the labels. And, uh, you know, there was, of course, some preferences, if I may use it. I don't know who was involved, but if I understand it correctly, it's a blind tasting and the wine received, uh, at the end of the day, received the honors it's supposed to get. So um, we can't mm -hmm. complain. Um, but they will always, you know, we live in a free country, so there will always be different opinions. Um, you know, what's good for me is not necessary for you, but uh, the people, the caliber of tasters, most of them escape wine masters and sort of quite, in my opinion, experts on their field. And I think we also need to, we need to be cognizant of the fact that methods and uh, study and education has changed over the many years. So, uh, and, and people like yourself are starting to pass on your intrinsic knowledge to a young generation. Whereas when you were at that young age, you might not have received the same sort of tutorage or mentorship. Uh, and, and so it, it, it kind of, it's kind of obvious to me that there is going to be an increase and we should be celebrating that. We shouldn't yeah, be debating, yeah, I, I do agree with you. fighting you know, with each other about it. Especially in a year like this, we need a bit of sort of uh, popping the corks and, and be happy and, and sort of compliment one another and, uh, you know, yeah. um, sort of uh, enjoy the, the outcome of it. You've, you've mentored more Cape Winemakers Guild protégés than any other guild member. What are some of the qualities that you think define a modern winemaker? What are you seeing amongst these youngsters? Um, you know, first of all, it, I, I consider it's like being in the religion. It's not something that, you're, that you write a test and good, 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 the outcome is you must become a winemaker or a radio presenter or an IT person. It's a different job. It's something that, uh, as I say, comes a bit from your tummy, you know, by way of saying it's a, it's a bit of a calling, if I may use that word. So uh, nobody, a guy, I, personally, I think nobody stand up one morning and say, oh, I'm going to become a winemaker. So you need to be exposed. You need to taste a few wines and... Uh, if you can, not everybody live close to the Cape that can spend a day or two in, in, in harvest time, you know, in the cellar. But uh, it's, it's definitely people that, that study well and, uh, you know, then you get to the, to the intrinsics of that. You get extroverts and introverts. And um, so I've been working, like you mentioned, with 13 different protégés and it's just amazing. I'm telling you, this is wonderful kids and uh, the most exciting thing about them is where they end up, the guys that went through my hands. And it's not just me, it's three years with three different guild members. So they just spend one of the years with me. I always take them in their second year, it's become a norm year. And from here they will work with uh, Miles Mossop or Giles Webb or Jan Bulan could see or Etienne Lurish. And from there in their third year, they can start applying for jobs. And after six months, and we are so excited that they get sort of suck up if I may use this word by the industry and um, just to get the youngsters that went through my hands there's a winemaker at Durbanville Hills, at Duncan Savage, at Flagstone, at KWV, you know just a few to be mentioned so I'm so proud of them but they need guidance eh? you, when you when you work with them you quickly realize they, they finish their studies also work with Els or Stellenbosch but they need guidance and, uh, and you know, I just uh, put a huge emphasis on sharing my knowledge and my experience with young people. So I encourage them. Some of them phone me and say, Charles, I made a mistake. You know, you must help me now in the winery or I must make a call between this job and that job or I have a, a huge conflict in my winery. And then I say, thank you for phoning me. And I want you to phone also other guild members and get 10 opinions, you know, five opinions and then form your own. But the fact that they keen to ask is for me a great sign. And, you know, they keen to learn and they keen to, to, to and they're proud of the products they make and the proud of the, of the, of the year they work in your cellar and they become part of the, of your team. It's really amazing. I can, I can spend hours with you, you know, talking through, uh, through each of them. And it's just great to host them. They arrive here, guy, 
uh, it's, I always say it's great to make a special wine like the Kutzeis we just talked about, but it's even more special to see a youngster arriving here as a, as a Grinke, as a rookie, and leave here as a more confident young potential winemaker. That gives me a huge kick, my friend, in this whole process. That's fantastic. That's awesome. And I can hear your passion for, for passing on that uh, knowledge, but not just knowledge, enthusiasm. Uh, yeah. Bringing, bringing the subject to, to a tangible and exciting kind of head, which is awesome. I, I yeah, want to ask... I, I put a huge emphasis on, uh, you know, being yourself. Our philosophy in here in the cellar is safety first, quality second, and having fun. And as you know, with having fun, is sharing things with one another. So that's our um, philosophy here in the cellar. Excellent. Uh, speaking of the cellar, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about um, what else is available at De Grendel. You've Obviously, we, if you haven't been to De Grendel yet, you've missed out on a, a wonderful tasting room with some incredible vistas. But that's not all you offer. You've got a fantastic restaurant and a game drive well, yeah we have a, we have a farm tour where you know you can visit vineyards and uh, blueberries on the farm and there's we have two camps with a bit of wildlife in it Ierland and Hartebeers and Bontebok and Springbok so yeah please guys phone and make a booking and uh, come and visit us it's really and then end up with a great tasting and if you're keen to if you made a booking in advance, because it's been a difficult year for the restaurant, but they open, they run on 50% capacity. And to prevent the disappointments, please make a booking uh, before, if you in, if you decide to have a, I think uh, walk-in meals will be very tricky nowadays with the whole COVID. So please make a booking. But it's just a great place. And uh, I, I hope uh, our staff, our uh, um, tasting room staff, can share a bit of knowledge with you. It's just not just a pour and say, this is, sir, this is Sauvignon Blanc. They can at least tell you where the fruit is from, how it's made. And we also put a big emphasis on that to, to have a friendly, knowledgeable staff to serve you. Awesome. Well, I must tell you a little story. Um, I proposed to my wife in a helicopter over Molniton Lagoon. Uh, and um, there was, it was gonna go one of two ways. If she said no, the doors were unlocked. Um, if she if she said yes, the pilot and I agreed it was worth celebrating at the Grendel. So luckily she said yes. And yeah. uh, we landed at the Grendel. We had some photos um, and we enjoyed a, a delicious lunch. And funnily enough, we now live on uh, Woodbridge Island where Sir David Kraft had his holiday home, uh, Zonicus. So I feel like my life is entwined with De Grendel um, yeah. in, in, in some weird sort of way. And I think the question I want to ask you, if, if you were to, to name only one of your wines as a collector's souvenir, you know, something, and maybe even for people that are, are immigrating or uh, tourists that are arriving and they, they just want to, they want to take one bottle home and they're going to keep that and that's going to be their memento. Uh, of the Grendel, what would you advise? I know it might be a horrible question. No, it's it's a bit unfair because I'm in love with each product. But uh, I must say, if if, the, if your clientele, or my, our our patrons, want to take a bottle with, I probably put my money on Rubaiyat. You know, it's a wine with so much sort of longevity and uh, ageability in it. So I'll I'll definitely. Uh, each vintage, I can tell you, each vintage that we produce is a wine that can mature for 10, 15 years if it's kept under ideal conditions. So I'll put my money on Rubaya. If, it, if, if you're very uh, fond of a Shiraz, of course, our Shiraz, Merlot, Pinot Dage and Pinot Noir will not sort of disappoint you. But if it gets to uh, expression of my style, it's probably Rubaya. Uh, I'm very, very fond of that. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to let you get back to work. I know you've got a lot to do, but before we go, I've got some quick fire, uh, rapid fire questions. Um, you don't have to give me long answers. Literally the first word that, that pops into your head as an answer to these questions. And um, we'll, we'll fire off with favorite grape variety to farm. To farm, uh, not to make, to farm, I will say Petit Verdot. It's a, it's a real variety that's very giving. 
that's very sort of um, honest and true. Um, of course, all varieties is honest and true, but you know, it's a, it, 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 it just gives so much. Uh, it's, it's so versatile and it, it's sort of uh, so workable. You can use it in so many different varieties. I will put my money on farming on Petit Verdot. We have quite a bit of Petit Verdot here on the farm. Excellent. My next one uh, is uh, smoothie or braai brookie. I know you're on somewhat of a diet, so that's why I'm asking this tricky yeah, question. I've been on a, on a juice diet, uh, um, um, Guy, but uh, luckily that's now passed. So my friend, due to my background and my very thin physique, I will definitely put my money on by Broiti. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, <laughs> what a relief, because I mean, yo, there's nothing worse than having to sip and smoothie uh, at a bride. I'm afraid you're going to ask me what kind of smoothie, so it's definitely Bri <laughs> uh, Um. What fashion trend do you just not get? You just don't understand it. You know, I'm 57 years old now, so I missed a lot of fashion trends, I must be honest with you. And I have a daughter of 27 that's very much into fashion and a son of 24 that's a, uh, hopefully a future chef to be. So I have my days with... Uh, fashion trends, you know, but I think if it, if it just, well, if, if we're not talking of clothes or shoes or some hairstyles, but something like for me, that's probably not fashion, but it's fascinating for me how the Google era work. You know, if you talk to any of my protégés or assistant winemakers or colleagues that's sitting here at my back, they are, of course, much younger than me. I say, let's, let's discuss something, you know, let's discuss that. And then immediately we'll say, but let's Google it. I said, no, I don't want to Google it. I want us to discuss it. So that's for me a, a trend that I must still get used to. I must probably get a bit of training on Google that I can uh, in incorporate it myself. But I want us to talk eh, and, and rub shoulders and, and discuss things and sort it out and not just quick, 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 quick go and Google it uh, because that's not what I want. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I whisper a little secret in your ear? Don't give, don't, don't give in and go across to, to the Google world. Stay with, <laughs> with your belief system because I have found how, I've found how, how dumb I've become since Google has taken over. I, I don't retain information the way I used to. You know, as a teenager, as, a, as an early adult, uh, I was very good m remembering things yeah. and stories. And I found that, that Google just makes it too simple now. Now you just, oh, I can't remember what the history of the Grendel is. Let me just Google it. If I'm trying yeah. to relate it to someone, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No, um, uh, what, have you, what have you done? And this doesn't necessarily only apply to wine. It can apply to anything in your life. What have you done that you are most proud of, Charles? Gee, guys, um, I'm a great fan of the... Latin word storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, that means family values. So I'm a great fan of family values. Um, my two kids is probably the proudest I am. And of course, like we mentioned, protégés and, and hopefully a few good wines that I've been involved in in the past. But I will say um, to create the environment for, for uh, friends and family to be at home and be friendly and people can be completely themselves and enjoy a glass of wine. And if you don't want to, you upset, you can just sit there and relax and enjoy the day. But uh, family values is for me probably my proudest that I, that I hopefully I could sort of create for my, for my family. Beautiful answer. And then lastly, what's your most memorable wine tasting experience? I, um, I, I was once, you know, this is a, a booklet. Um, it was presented by um, Albert de Villay. He's the owner, winemaker of uh, Romery Conti in Burgundy. And it's just purely coincidence. The book is live here. We discuss it, not Google it. We discuss it with my, uh, with my two partners here in the cellar. And uh, this is probably the best tasting I ever attend. This gentleman was here three, four years ago. He was invited by Great Domains. They, they distribute a little bit of uh, um, Romery Conti they can sell in South Africa. And if I remember correctly, Guy present free tastings and then the guild contacted him and he decided to do another one for us. We all paid, made a contribution because it's with Chateau Petrus, the most expensive wines. But the way this gentleman is old, he must be in his 70s, Albert de Villay, the way he presented and the questions that you can imagine are 30 or 40 
uh, outspoken senior winemakers of South Africa ask him, and the way he answered it, you could see he's a real thinker about things and a real philosopher, and the wines were unbelievable. Can you believe it that I asked for an empty bottle as a memory, uh, you know, to put on my shelf in my dry room in, at home, and unfortunately, the two representatives of Great Domain say, sorry, sir, you can't get an empty bottle. So I say, why? You know, an empty bottle, you're going to chuck it away. Yeah. They say, no, that's the philosophy of uh, um, Romary Ponti. And I don't know exactly how it worked, but they're afraid of counterfeiting, you know, that they feel I can maybe take a bottle home. And, you know, there's so many stories now in China and places in the world where people counterfeit labels and put a secondary product in the bottle. But... I was really amazed. I still say that's probably one of the best tastings I ever uh, uh, took part in or attended. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, you're invited to get along to Liquor City Claremont to buy the Grendel wine. And if you fancy your luck, then answer the easy question here on the via the grapevine page. And you could win a one and a half liter de Grendel Ilum Shiraz 2018. One and a half liters Magnum. Uh, them in a wooden case, a great gift. It's another five-star wine. It's from the Southern Cape, and it has this very unique characteristic of what the French call rutundin or pepperiness in it. And that's one of the few regions in South Africa or area smaller appellations that year on year produce this very unique black, uh, black, not black carrot, black pepper characteristic that the French call rutunda. Rutunda. I've learned something. No, very... rutundin, rutundin guy. Rutandan. Rutandan, Rutandan, yeah. And look that's valued on, at... Look, look it up on Google, my friend. <laughs> I shall do so. <laughs> that, uh, that's valued at 765 Rand. Plus, Charles is throwing in a flagship tasting for two, valued at 240 Rand. So your total prize of over 1,000 Rand. Charles Hopkins, thank you for your time today, sir. It's been a privilege and an honor to chat with you. Well, the same from my side, and I, I, I hope, guys, we, we can put this year behind us, the virus behind us. I think we, we can't let our guard down. It's still a reality if you look what's happening in Europe, but um, I hope we can rub shoulders in the near future and clean a glass and just have fun and, and be more relaxed about this whole situation. But thank you very much. It was an honor and a privilege chatting to you guys. Cheers, Charles. Cheers, eh? Thanks, eh? Thank you. Bye. This via the grapevine was brought to you by Liquor City Claremont. Visit their wine emporium for a journey via the grapevine.